still this thing to work. Okay. Thank you for your patience. We are ready for the final talk of the day, which is by uh, Andreas Blass. Okay, so I gave a title here that lists a lot of topics. I don't actually promise to get to all the topics in half an hour, but we'll see how far I get. Um, there's three pieces of mathematics and one piece of physics here. So even though the physics is listed last, I'm going to talk about it first to get it out of the way. Um, this is also the part that's most relevant to computation. Um, anions. So I need to tell you what they are and why we might care about them. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Is it possible to make it bigger? Um, it is not possible for me to make it bigger. It may be possible for experts to make it bigger. <laughs> uh, but no, I don't think so, because it's already using the full screen here. Um, it looks bigger if you come closer. <laughs> <laughs> it looks real big to me. <laughs> um, OK, so. Anions are very small objects, as you see. <laughs> uh, anions, it says here, are particle-like excitations that can exist in two-dimensional space. I need to explain a couple of things about that. First of all, uh, this is an aspect of quantum theory, quantum computing, and so on. And particle-like excitation is pretty much the same as particle, if you get right down to it, because even what you normally call particles, like electrons and photons and stuff like that, are in fact, from the point of view of quantum field theory, excitations of a certain field. So uh, particle excitations literally would be synonymous with particle, but um, don't take physics literally. That's one of the lessons I've learned. Um, the real meaning of particle-like excitation seems to be that you treat them like particles until that starts to look absurd. And then you say, oh, they're not really particles. They're only particle-like excitations. And you get to make exceptions to all the usual rules. I personally have not yet gotten the hang of when you're allowed to make exceptions. I think it's just before you arrive at a contradiction. <laughs> um, by the way, that, that, that idea this is going to be the one piece of actual logic in my talk. That idea <laughs> is a familiar one, actually, from logic, um, showing that the derivability conditions are needed for the Gödel incompleteness theorems. I think it was Pfefferman who pointed out that you can give a perfectly good definition in arithmetic of what the Gödel numbers of the axioms of Peano arithmetic are, such that the consistency is provable in Peano arithmetic. You just say an axiom is something which satisfies the usual definition of axiom, and it and all the earlier axioms together do not lead to a contradiction. That's provably consistent. So same idea here. Just if, you, if you're about to get a contradiction, don't. Um, OK, two-dimensional space. This is another potential problem, because uh, we seem to be in a three-dimensional space here. Um, how do things get to be excitations or particles or whatever in a two-dimensional space? There's sort of an obvious and a non-obvious way. The obvious way is that the thing, whatever it is, should be confined to a very thin layer of something or other, or perhaps to the boundary of some solid object or something of that sort. There is, however, another way that things can be de facto two-dimensional, Namely, by being infinite in the third dimension, if you have uh, a long solenoid, electric current going around like this, producing a magnetic field going through the middle, if that's long enough compared to the horizontal dimensions, then in effect, these things are acting like two-dimensional objects. These huge cylinders move around, and are their position is described by two parameters. So it's entirely possible to have mathematically two-dimensional things happening in a three-dimensional actual space. So that part is not quite as fishy as the particle-like excitations. OK, what can we do with these anions? The important property of anions for our purposes is that if you move 
anions around each other, the state can change. Um, I'm going to pretend that this whiteboard is the two-dimensional world in which these anions live. And if you have several of them sitting here, and you, for instance, interchange the position of two of them, move this one to here and move that one to there, if these were anions of the same sort, the final state looks just like the initial state. Quantum mechanics says state is determined by a Hilbert space vector up to a phase factor. This can produce a different phase factor. It can, in fact, because these are anions and in a two-dimensional space, produce more complicated effects than phase factors, and that's going to be much of the uh, importance of, of anions for quantum computing. It's also going to be much of what I need to talk about in this talk when I get to the other three topics in my title. Um, so it says on the slide, even if every anion returns to its initial position, so that means if you do this interchange twice, it may still be diff the result may still be something different from what you had initially. Um, the reason anybody in computation is interested in these things is twofold. First of all, these operations of moving these things around produce in the end, unitary operations on the states of the system. And those unitary operations can be used as ingredients of quantum computation algorithms. So one idea here is to be able to do quantum computation simply by providing a supply of anions and then moving them around according to some, well, some quantum program. The second important ingredient is that the unitary transformation that you get by moving the anions in a certain way doesn't depend on the details. If I go up here with a shaky hand and move them around like that, it will still produce the same result as if I moved it nice and smoothly. The effect on the system, what happens in the computation, depends only on the topological properties of which anions did you move around which other ones and so on, not on the details of how you moved them. That means that small errors like a shaky hand or a shaky instrumentation or a general problem, environmental interference in your computation, is less likely to cause errors in the quantum computation when it's based on topological phenomena of this sort. So the hope is that there will be fewer errors, less need for error correction. Maybe I should repeat something which I, okay, the following is not something I know, I'm just repeating what I was told. That in most situations that people have designed for trying to do quantum computation, by far the largest part of what needs to be done during the computation is error correction. In contrast to classical computation, my understanding is that machines like this essentially don't bother with error correction because errors are so rare that anyway it doesn't make any difference. Um, that's pro both of those may be an overstatement, but uh, <laughs> something along those lines is, is true. So this is why anions are of potential use for computation and why people like Yuri and I, I should have, it was written on the title slide, but I didn't actually say that Yuri is, uh, is my co-author on all of this material. Um, on the other hand, I don't think I've actually shown him any of these slides, so he's not responsible for whatever mistakes I make. Um, okay, so that's why Microsoft and others, I think IBM also are interested in things of this sort. Uh, Oh good, anion models. This is much better than any. Anions are in physics, anion models are in mathematics. <laughs> so we're making progress here. Um, on the other hand, anion the standard anion model is modular tensor categories which have a, I guess I can say a truly marvelous definition that will not fit into this talk. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about 
what goes into an Anion model, nowhere near the complete story. And in fact, I'm going to specialize to a particular model very soon. But the general, one general aspect in Anion models is they tell you what happens if you bring two anions together and let them interact. And the general situation is that there are various possibilities that could come out. Uh, they may annihilate. They may produce another anion of a different sort. They may produce a different anion of the same sort. All kinds of things can happen. Different models have different specifications for that. I'm going to be talking mainly about one particular model uh, named after somebody who was long before any quantum computations or anions or anything of that sort. Um, so this is sort of the ideal thing for a mathematician to get your name so thoroughly embedded in the, in the language that uh, it shows up on things that you never dreamed of. So what are Fibonacci anions? Fibonacci anions, tau is the symbol for Fibonacci anion. At least it is in this talk. It is in some other places too. Um, the fusion rule, this is to be read as if you take a Fibonacci anion and another Fibonacci anion and fuse them together, the result will be a Fibonacci anion or vacuum. One is the vacuum, the identity for the multiplication. So the multiplication operation here is bring them together. The plus is alternative options of what can happen. So vacuum is called one because if you bring a vacuum together with anything, you got the anything. It acts like a unit for the multiplication. Okay. Um, this equation, if you read it in terms of numbers, if you pretend that tau is a number and times and plus are ordinary arithmetical operations, uh, that quadratic equation has two solutions, the positive one of which is the golden ratio, and that gets you pretty close to Fibonacci already. Um, so that's Fibonacci fusion rule. So Fibonacci anions are simply, by definition, anions that obey that fusion rule. And there's a picture of them. The anions fuse downward in my pictures. So two, an two Fibonacci anions fusing to one or f annihilating each other, fusing to vacuum. So is this supposed to be a non-deterministic rule? How should they Yeah, that, oh, yeah, unfortunately this is uh, getting dangerously close to physics again. <laughs> uh, so in the usual model, this is indeed non-deterministic and in fact these things live in sep these Possibility, these fusion possibilities are represented by vectors in different Hilbert spaces. Um, on the other hand, I can, given enough time, point you to a place in the literature where it says that these two are alternatives to each other and tells you what the probability of each is. It does not tell you under what circumstances those probabilities are valid. Um, some restriction on the circumstances is certainly needed and we have asked, and I don't think we ever got an answer about when are those alleged probabilities actually correct. Um, that's why I wanted to get the physics out of the way. And as early as possible to get it far away from the question period at the end of the talk. <laughs> um, let's see. You have three Fibonacci anions. Here are the two. Here are two ways to fuse them to one Fibonacci anion. In these pictures, I'm fusing the left pair first. It can produce either another Fibonacci anion or a vacuum. And whichever it produces can then fuse with the one on the right to produce another Fibonacci anion. There's a third process, which is not shown here because it doesn't fit the title. Three Fibonacci anions can fuse to vacuum by first fusing to one anion here, and then that one and this one can fuse to vacuum. So there are actually three options. By the way, one option for fusing to vacuum, two options for fusing to a single anion, three altogether. This is the beginning of the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci's <laughs> name is justified here. Um, these two fusion processes as I mentioned in answer to Fokion's question, 
Uh, the fusion processes are for some reason actually considered to be the vectors in the Hilbert space. And these two fusion processes span, well, since there's two of them, they span a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And this is a qubit, the quantum analog of a bit. So a bit is one of two elements of a two-element set. A qubit is a state in a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And they are analogous from classical to quantum computation. Now, I adopted a fairly arbitrary convention here of fusing the left pair first. You can fuse the right pair first. And I was too lazy to draw another picture. Um, but you can imagine it, or you can get behind the blackboard and look from the other side. And if these things are really too small, you may see just as much. Um, you get another basis for the same Hilbert space. They are not the same basis. There is, they are both orthonormal bases, but they're related by some non-trivial transformation, a unitary transformation, which it says here is completely determined up to normalizations. This is not always the case. More complicated fusion rules may leave you several choices for how these things match up. But in the case of Fibonacci, things are simple. There's only uh, one option. Up to normalizations means changing a, one of the basis factors by a phase factor or something like that. And in fact, here is the transformation. Uh, you may notice that Q is very close to the golden ratio. It's got a minus where the golden ratio would have a plus. This is actually the reciprocal of the golden ratio. A Q and its square root show up in here. And this is one of the few places where I can be sloppy and actually get away with it. The unitary transformation transforming one basis to the other. I didn't say which way, which one gets transformed to which one. Fortunately, that matrix is its own inverse, so it actually works both ways. One piece of good luck. You see, once you start doing mathematics instead of physics, things are much nicer. Um, Braiding. Braiding is this sort of thing. <coughs> Moving anions past the, you start with a bunch of anions conventionally lined up nicely and numbered, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you move them around each other, ultimately returning to their original positions, but perhaps doing far more complicated things than this, like leave most of them alone and move this one around through here back, up, like that, stuff like that, okay? So think of braiding as moving a finite collection of points in the plane through some paths, ultimately coming back either to their original positions or perhaps switching positions, permuting where they were, but coming back ultimately to the same set of six points. If you want to really do mathematics, then you say what you're looking at is the set of six element subsets of the plane and you're looking at the fundamental group of the space of such six element subsets. You're looking at all the ways they can be moved around to return to the same set. Um, okay, so let's see. I was, the slide says braiding two anions, so forget the rest of the six and think of these two. Passing one in front of the other. Uh, when I think of in front, Think of viewing the picture from below. So this one is passing in front of that one when you interchange them this way. Behind would be the arrows in the opposite direction. OK. Um, I need to draw some pictures, ultimately. In fact, before I do that, I'll draw a picture of this. The problem with this picture is that we're looking at the whole plane and the temporal aspect is just me waving my hand. It's better if you draw the temporal aspect. So you get something like this. You have your points here at one time. You have the points <coughs> here at a later time. And they move from the earlier to the later. So you're drawing like the world lines in the sense of relativity theory. <coughs> like that, and I mark the crossing with a little break to indicate that this guy passed in front of that guy, while the others, I guess, just sat there and did nothing. 
So <laughs> you were talking about on the previous slide about fusing things, combining things. Right. So that's not that's great. done in some sense afterward. It's the fusion rule determines what's going to happen in the braiding, but you're not actually fusing anything here. You're moving them around, and then ultimately the fusion might be considered, notice the vagueness in the physics here, might be considered as a way of measuring the final state of the system. Fuse everything and see what, see what you end up with. Um, okay, so, if you, if you braid just two anions, the fusion process, so here are the two fusion processes, the trees that you see there are the ones that we saw a couple slides ago, the two ways to fuse two anions to one. What I've added here is if you were to braid this one in front of that one, or in this configuration, braid this one in front of that one, then the quantum state involved would acquire a phase factor <laughs> Rather strange phase factors, there's this zeta in here, which you can infer from the equations, but I can also tell you. Zeta is a primitive fifth root of unity. It plus its reciprocal gives you the, our friend Q, the reciprocal golden ratio from before. Uh, and these phases, <coughs> rather remarkably, are again forced. You, this is not something somebody made up. Well. There was something Fibonacci made up. It comes from the fusion rules. You can actually deduce these things from the fusion rules. Okay. Um, if you're going to break three or more Fibonacci anions, then you get more complicated fusion rules. I see I need to talk a lot faster, but I need to also draw this picture for you. If you were to braid these two, then, depending on whether you're in this picture where you fuse to tau or this picture where you fuse to one, you're going to end up with phase factors like what we had on the other slide. If you're going to braid these two, you're in a different situation because these are not fusing to tau or to one. These are doing some other stuff first and then fusing. What you have to do is go to this other basis where these two are considered that's fusing immediately, which means you're going to get the stuff on the other slide, those phase factors, conjugated by the unitary matrix that we had here, which means you're going to get some non-trivial stuff, which I believe I did not write down here, just as well. For three anions fusing to, fusing to one, so this is the qubit that we were talking about before, the two braid operations, when we braid the first two or braid the last two, generate a dense subgroup of the unitary group, so you get, it's a good approximation, any unitary matrix you want. Given that we can calculate, uh, that we can use three Fibonacci anions fusing to one to produce, to, to serve as a qubit, to produce a basis for two-dimensional space, do it twice. Take six Fibonacci anions, fuse them to one, fuse these to one, just to finish the job, fuse those two to vacuum. Why not? They could fuse to one, but I want vacuum. I'll tell you why in a moment. Okay. Those six anions fusing to vacuum can give you um, two qubits. I again got tired of drawing pictures. So the four good options are you could have either a tau or a vacuum here and still end up with a tau. That's your first qubit. Same for your second qubit. This one's drawn backwards, fusing the right half instead of the left half. That's because this is a conference on symmetry and I want the picture to be symmetric. You could do it the other way, but I like to do it this way. And then these two fuse to vacuum at the end. Um, it says here four of the five options correspond to the qubits that you want. The fifth option is where each side individually fuses to vacuum, and then, well, I guess two vacuums fuse to one vacuum, which is not much going on. That's junk. That's not part of the two qubit space that you want. And one of the reasons that Yuri and I are worrying about these things is that one wants to know how much computation can you do, how much braiding can preserve the good space, the four qubit space, rather than producing results that have components in the direction of the fifth 
basis vector. So at this point, oh, I don't remember exactly when I started, but I'm sure I don't have much time. Um, we need to analyze the braid group, which is the group of all, <coughs> take braids like this, and compose them by just setting one after the other. Pile them up, okay? <coughs> six strands, because I'm talking about six anions there. What I say about six generalizes to n, but I don't want to draw n. Um, it's generated by, whoops, I got too much here, five so-called Artin generators, because Artin was the first to study the braid group. Uh, this is Artin generator number three, because it uses braid number three in front of number four. So generator number K puts braid K in front of braid K plus one. And it's not too difficult to see that by composing those, you can get any complicated configuration of braids. The braid generators satisfy two sets of relations. Um, obvious ones, if you're doing two interchanges that are far apart from each other, it doesn't matter in what order you do them. And then there's an interesting one where the adjacent ones commute. And I was going to draw a picture of that, but I think in the interest of time, I will save pictures for later. So you have and a theorem of Artin, a not, very, a not so trivial theorem of Artin, is that those generators and those relations suffice to completely determine the braid group. That is a presentation of the braid group. Uh, well, yeah, higher braid groups work just as well. Braid groups have some silly one-dimensional representations. One-dimensional means instead of using a matrix, a one-dimensional matrix is like a number, so you're representing each generated by a number, and when you do that, this relation forces you to represent all generators by the same number, so you're just doing some scalar factor. Uninteresting. There's also interesting representations. One that got studied, I think, way back in the 1930s, called the Burau representation, and being that old, it is indeed a well-studied representation. Um, fortunately, I don't have time to tell you any more than what I actually know about it, which is very little. Um, there's a theorem of Formanek from, I think, the 1980s that says that if you have an irreducible representation of the n-strand braid group, think six strands for my example, in a space of dimension less than six, like the five from the five trees from the previous slide, then it's obtainable by taking a product of one of those trivial one-dimensional scalar things and a composition factor of a Borel representation. Well, except when n is four, five, or six. <coughs> and six is the case that I'm interested in. <coughs> and six is, in fact, one of the, the representation that we get from Fibonacci braiding is one of the exceptional ones. Fortunately, Formanek also wrote down the exceptional one. And here it is. Now, yeah, if this talk were infinitely long, I would give you a nice discussion of these matrices are actually quite nice. Um, but I will only point out that each of them has on the diagonal two occurrences of minus zeta to the fourth, one occurrence is in the first two, one occurrence is in the last three columns. And once you know where those two occurrences are, the rest of the matrix is completely determined. Ones on the rest of the diagonal, zeros above and below the ones, and then some non-trivial stuff above and below the diagonal zeta to the fourth. If you really want to know, you should read the next slide much faster than I can do it aloud. Um, the matrices, let me begin at the beginning here. These matrices that we got, the Formanek got, are not unitary. So they represent the Fibonacci situation, which was unitary matrices, but in a non-orthonormal basis. They go to a weird basis. Okay, but they're nicer. They don't, for instance, involve that square root of Q. The entries of the Fibonacci, of the Formanek matrices are entirely cyclotomic integers. So things are nicer in that respect. The last paragraph, that wall of text up there that begins with each of these can be completely described. That's saying how to read off the whole matrix once you know where the minus zeta to the fourths are. Um, if you go, 
if you look at where those minus eta to the fourths are, I made a convenient list here. And you see, as you go through the list of Archer generators, one, two, three, four, five, you get two, one, two, one, two, looks nice and symmetric, five, three, four, five, three, gee, there ought to be a four down there, and there ought to be a one in the other column. Um, there ought to be a sixth Archer generator, like that. <coughs> there is. Why is it? This does deserve a picture. Instead of starting with these six guys there, put them around in a circle. So here are, Arten, here are strands one, two, three, four, five, six. Just as each one can pass in front of the next one and produce an item generator, you can do the same thing. Well, passing in front now becomes passing outside the circle. The analogous thing up here gives you a sixth group element analogous to the art and generators. And when you work out where it what it's representing matrix is, it's exactly the thing you would want with uh, zeta fourth in positions one and four. So that's nice. Um, and what I've written here is just a description of the red stuff. Wrap Instead of lining them up, wrap them around in a circle. That's not a full description, though. I could have wrapped them around in a circle this way. Does it matter? It matters to the braid group. Those are different braid group elements that you get as the sixth analog of sigma 1 through 5. But fortunately, they both represent the same thing in the Fibonacci representation. Now, if I'm right, my next slide is going to say Hecke algebras. And I think rather than talking excessively long about Hecke algebras, I will just say there's a bunch of stuff on slides about Hecke algebras here. Actually, I think it's only two slides. One, <coughs> two, that's it. OK. And it ends with needing a 695-dimensional kernel of something or other that remains mysterious. In fact, all 695-dimensional things are mysterious. <laughs> and I think that's probably as good a place to stop since I'm already slightly over time. Thank you. Any questions? So, yes? So, uh, what would be uh, some question you want to address, some example? Yeah. Okay. The, the basic question that I would love to know the answer to is this. Look at that five-dimensional representation of the braid group. In terms of the five, genera five basis vectors corresponding to what I called the four desirable matrices, and the fifth one. So I have a five-dimensional standard orthonormal basis. A four-dimensional subspace is where the qubits that I'm interested in live. A five-dimensional subspace of the fifth dimension is there because well, it has to be there. I have no choice about it. What I would like is to be able to do braid group operations, some complicated braiding steps that will map this subspace into itself so that I'm actually able to do computations with those two qubits without worrying about those. Now, there are braid operations that will do this. For one thing, if I do any braiding I want on just these three, or on just these three, or if I just pick up these three and move them all past that. But none of those get me really anything that combines the two qubits. So the one question called the leakage problem, because you don't want to leak into this subspace, is are there elements of the braid group which map this four-dimensional subspace into itself and are not trivial in the sense that I just described? And this has apparently been an open problem for quite a while. And yeah, I guess the main result of our work is that it motivates lots of interesting stuff, but we still, we're beginning to see why it's been an open problem for a while. So <clears throat> these uh, topological qubits were invented with the idea that one would rely on topological non-triviality to give you robustness mm -hmm. against noise. Right. But now you have this leakage phenomenon. 
which can perhaps be thought of as a voice, right? And will that invoke the need for error correction again? Uh, that is a good reason for wanting to solve the leakage problem and do this, do the computations without leakage. So um, but yes, there, there's going to be, there certainly is going to be a problem as long as you have leakage. I mean, you can make the leakage small. That, that can be done. You can make it extremely small. But some of these quantum circuits require very long iteration. You, you do this gate and that gate and that gate and that. And if each one has small leakage and it starts to accumulate, you can get very serious problems. So it, it does seem to be really worthwhile to, to avoid the leakage in order to be able to do genuinely quantum, genuinely topological quantum computing on that space without having this one get in the way. So what exactly do you have control over? What, the only thing you can control is what braids you're using. How are you moving the anions around each other? So you need, you need to look for fancy elements of the braid group that preserve a four-dimensional subspace, but don't do it for trivial reasons. But you could measure the whole five-dimensional space, is that right? Pardon? You could measure the whole five-dimensional You could, you could, yeah. Yeah, you can control, you can measure stuff in the five-dimensional space. In the sense um, you're still preserving the exact answer. I'm still preserving something, but it, well, the exact answer to what have you computed, yes, but the exact answer to what were you trying to compute in this four-dimensional space, that's more questionable. Can you give some nice interpretations of the, say, the basic uh, quantum gates that one uses in the, Pardon? can you give also nice pictures for the basic quantum gates that one uses to um, set up quantum One gates? can see pictures. Um, nice pictures, I haven't seen them. Um, so, for example, there's a paper of Prakash that contains, toward the end, if I remember correctly, uh, a, yeah. a picture of a braid that gives a very good approximation to a C-naught gate, which is one of the basic ones that you always use. Um, and, uh, well, okay. I'm, I'm glad you saved me the uh, embarrassment of saying that. It, it, uh, I mean, it, it's not that it's a horrible picture. It's a horrible braid that he drew a very nice picture of. <laughs> but, so you need horrible braids to get a very simple gate. Uh, to get a very simple so how thing, the, yeah. The well, you have to remember that in the quantum circuits that people actually want to work with are extremely long. So if you have something like this that was, I don't know, what was it, maybe 50 Arten Gen, pardon? 28 Arten generators long, that's, that's not that bad. A factor of 28 in the length of your overall okay. quantum circuit is, well, you know, you'd rather have a factor of two, but, <laughs> but 28 is, I think, quite tolerable. And I'm not sure that, the, that this 28 is optimal. I mean, it's just that here is a way to get a good approximation. What is optimal? Uh, so uh, at least no one attempted to optimize that. So it may be that one can do better. And that's you know, one of the things that Yuri and I have been trying to do, is compute a lot of stuff and see, see what you can achieve. Can you say two words about where the Hecke algebra is coming? The Hecke algebra comes, yeah, I can say two eigenvalues. <laughs> Maybe I should say more than two words. Um, Hecke algebra is what you get if you take the group algebra. So first of all, think of the group embedded as a basis of, a, of an algebra using the group operation on the basis vectors and extend linearly. So you're looking at a group algebra. Representation of the group, like the things we've been talking about, is also a representation of that algebra. But these representations are exceptionally good because the, the group, sorry, the matrices that represent these basic braids that just switch to. Even though they're five by five matrices, they're very nice in that they have only two distinct eigenvalues, one with multiplicity two and one with multiplicity three. A Hecke algebra is what you get if you determine what those two eigenvalues are and impose on the algebra 
additional relations saying that each of these generators shall have only those eigenvalues. So if the eigenvalues are A and B, you say for each generator, say sigma, sigma minus A times sigma minus B equals zero. The quotient of the group algebra by all of that, by all of those for all the generators, is what's called the Hecke algebra, sometimes the Iwahori Hecke algebra. And the representations that we're getting are representations of that algebra. And the big advantage is that the group algebra is this big infinite dimensional thing. The Hecke algebra for n strands is, well, the good news is finite dimensional. The bad news is n factorial dimensional. Um, so when you're doing three strands, life is nice. You have six dimensional Hecke algebra, you have a four dimensional representation because it's sorry, four dimensional space of matrices, two by two matrices. And so there's a two dimensional kernel for that and we know exactly what the kernel is and everything is nice. With six strands, you have 720 dimensional Hecke algebra projecting to five by five matrices, which is 25 dimensions. And that's why I said at the end of all of this that we end up with a 695 dimensional kernel there. Um, and yes, it remains mysterious. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think we should close off the questions. Thank you.